begin our Advent journey, <clears throat> the first candle symbolizes hope. Have you ever waited so long for something that you wondered whether it would ever come? I have a friend who has her birthday right near Christmas, and she always felt like she had to wait so long for it to come each year. As a kid, Christmas Eve always seemed to last forever, especially as we waited for morning to come and open presents under the tree. The Jewish people were waiting on a Messiah to come, to be their champion and to save them. But the Messiah, Jesus, didn't come for a long time. Isaiah was a prophet in the Old Testament and declared to the people that their Messiah was coming. This prophecy gave the people great hope. They began to expectantly wait for the Messiah because of this hope. And you know what? Jesus came to earth just like Isaiah said he would. He was born as a baby, the son of God, born to a teenage girl from Bethlehem. And he came to us, to you and to me. What great hope this gives us that if God kept his promise to come to earth, I can trust every other promise the Bible talks about. Isaiah 9, 6 says, a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, he will rule over us, and he will be called Wonderful Advisor and Mighty God. He will also be called Father who lives forever and Prince who brings peace. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, kids, for doing that. Yes, please. Tell me what little boy doesn't like to play with fire, right? <laughs> oh, thank you, Catherine. Thank you, boys, for doing that as we prepare our hearts to enter into this holiday season. Can you believe that we're at Christmas already? I mean, I don't know about you, but it just seems to go by so fast. I know some here probably think it's been forever. I can't wait. Uh, it, I, I've found this to be true as I go. The older I get, the faster it comes. You know, the years go, time goes. And so we are getting ready to celebrate, as we read today, to enter into the season of Advent. I want to take some time and talk to you about what that means, because <clears throat> a lot of times people don't even understand what Advent's about. And uh, if you'd like to join us, uh, Pastor Chris had mentioned about some journals. There are a few that are left that look like this. If you want to join us on a journey for uh, Advent and kind of have a little bit of a devotional to go through. But I want to take some time and just kind of prepare our hearts about Advent, what it is, how does it apply to us, and my challenge today is that we can learn from the Word of God. There's four words that I'm going to be, four topics that are covered in, in Advent, and that is hope, faith, joy, and peace. So today we're going to talk about hope, <coughs> how our hope can be found in Jesus Christ. Next week we will talk about faith, the week after that will be joy, and then the week of Christmas right there we're going to talk about peace and, and the great peace that God gives us. So um, I want you to just prepare your hearts. We're going to take a look in a couple different scriptures today. And what we find about Advent, what we find about the celebration of the coming of Jesus, because after all, that's what Advent simply means. It means coming or arrival. So we are celebrating the arrival of Jesus. Uh, Christmas, yes, it's fun to celebrate unwrapped gifts, string lights, but it's about celebrating the coming of Jesus. And in the Bible, the Jewish people, they were waiting on the Messiah to come. They wanted the Messiah to be their champion. They were waiting for this promise of, of the Messiah to come in and give them the victory. You know, it wasn't just about another king or, you know, um, another leader. They were looking to the Messiah that was going to come and be their champion that would give them the freedom, yet they didn't understand how long it was going to take. Let me ask you, have you ever asked God or God has given you a promise and it seems like from the moment he gave you the promise to you seeing it fulfilled, it feels like a long time. Well, that's how the children of Israel were. They were waiting a long time and here's what happened. They heard this promise that the, there's the coming of the Messiah, but it seems so long they started to lose hope. They started to lose hope in the, the promise that was given. So in the Old Testament, uh, Isaiah came to the people and he had a prophetic word. Isaiah is a prophet and he spoke on God's behalf. And, and a lot of times people ask, how do you know when it's a prophet and when it's a false prophet? Well, one of the quickest ways is when they come saying, thus saith the Lord, watch and see if the Lord ever thus did anything about it. You know, because if he didn't, uh, then it, wasn't, it, probably, it probably wasn't of God. But Isaiah 
was a man of God. He was a prophet. And he saw the people, the Jewish people, losing hope. They were kind of getting discouraged in their hearts because it had been such a long time. And, and so Isaiah shows up and speaks to, the, speaks to them and gives them a prophetic word so that they can have a great hope. They began to expectantly wait for the Messiah because of the hope that Isaiah gave them. Isaiah showed up, and in the reading that Catherine and the boys did this morning, and I'm going to read it once again, this is the word that Isaiah spoke to the people. They started to get discouraged. They started to get disheartened. They were losing hope. And so God sent his prophet to the people to basically say, hey, don't lose hope. Don't lose hope. You ever been there? I mean, you're waiting for the promotion or the job or the, 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 the husband or the wife or I don't know, you know, whatever it is that you're dreaming about. And you start losing hope. And somebody comes along and gives you an encouraging word that lifts you up. You know, that, that feels good. But we're talking about an eternal hope that Jesus gives to you and to me. And Isaiah came to these people who were losing hope and said this in Isaiah 9, 6. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Now, this word that he gave was to encourage their hearts that the time was was still going to come. I, I want to take a look at a different portion of Scripture, though. And, um, and so this one's a little lengthy. I don't know if it's up on the, on the slides or not, but you can uh, write it down. I think I referred to it. By the way, there's an outline in your bulletin if you'd like to follow along with. And I want to look at Matthew chapter 1. Um, this is going to be kind of an odd Scripture, okay? Because it's one that's not really used a lot. It's one that's not really read uh, a lot. But it's about the genealogy of Jesus, where where his family comes from. So I want to take a look at this portion of Scripture because there's something in this. You know, I don't know if you're like me. When I read the genealogies, maybe I should say, if I read the genealogies. Hey, you ever been guilty of that? And he begat that, and he begat that. And yeah, okay, let's get down to the good stuff, right? Because, you know, sometimes you think, I don't want to read all this, who, who had who. But it's in the Bible for a reason. And so as I was looking at it and kind of reading through it uh, this last week, something just kind of popped out at me I wanted to kind of grab a hold of. And so this is Matthew chapter 1, and it says, The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, and Judah the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar, and Perez the father of Hezron, and Hezron the father of Ram, and Ram the father of Amminadab, Amminadab the father of Nashon, Nashon the father of Salmon, Salmon the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of David the king. Now let's just pause a minute and ask the question that's obvious. Where in the world did they get their names from? Good Lord, that's a tongue twister sometimes, right? And that's one of the easier genealogies. Let me jump down to verse 15. It says, Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who was called the Christ. So it says, so all the generations from Abraham to David were 14 generations, just from Abraham to David. And from David to the deportation to Babylon, another 14 generations. And from the deportation to Babylon to Christ, another 14 generations generations. So you may be asking right now, why are you sharing all of this? What does this have to do with Christmas? What does this have to do with hope? Well, if you're like me, my answer would have been, well, because it's Jesus and Jesus is hope, right? Okay, yes. But let's dig a little bit deeper. And I'm, I'm going to circle around in a few minutes and get back to that. But Matthew, what he does for us here is he shows us the whole lineage that is taking place in order for Jesus to arrive on the scene. <coughs> Excuse me. It's Jesus' family tree. His, if you've been in EH anything, it, it's his genogram, right? And it shows the different generations that had to line up perfectly or that did line up perfectly that led to this moment where Jesus arrives. And the thing that we're celebrating is not the fact that just some boy named Jesus arrived, but eternal hope came. That, that's what we're celebrating. And it got me thinking as I read through all of the names that were taking place that led to this point where we now experience the birth of Jesus. I think of Jesus had to grow up in a family, right? Think about it this way. Think of your family, all right? 
And think about the one, you know, who's the princess and the one who's the athletic and the one who's the smart and the one who's, you know, labeled maybe not, or the one who's good, the one who's bad, you know, whatever it is your family system sets up. Imagine now being the parent and thrown to the mix, raising Jesus, the Messiah. Can you imagine the family dynamics that took place in that home? I mean, I, I, I can't. My mind can't even wrap around that. But you see, we're not just talking about the birth of a man named Jesus, but we're talking about the birth of a new hope because it is the coming. Advent means the coming or the arrival of the Messiah. So when you celebrate Advent, you're celebrating the arrival of the birth of Jesus. And I can only think, or we should think this way, that the reason we celebrate the coming of the Messiah is because we have a need for a Savior. And if we're not aware of that, I pray that your heart becomes so aware. Because one of the things we must determine right now in this world that, that is crazy and chaotic is that there is always hope. There is always hope. I don't care how far gone you are. I don't care what kind of mistakes you've made. I don't care even about the thoughts that you thunk that nobody else heard. Jesus says, there is a hope for you. There's hope for you. There's hope for each and every one of us. But the question remains, what is hope? You see, that hope is, that's found in Jesus Christ, it's found in relationship with Jesus. The hope that you you want. If you're here today and you're not a Christian, my prayer is, is that you would become a Christian because when you receive Jesus, you receive all of the hope, the eternal hope that you could ever want and dream of. But if you're here today and you are a Christian, just because you're a Christian doesn't mean you never feel hopeless, does it? No. Christians, everyone, you can shake your head no, it's okay. We still experience times where we feel hopeless. We feel helpless. We feel like we don't have what it takes, but even then, he says, there is a hope. There is always hope, but what is it? Well, if we go over to Webster and try to find out what he has to say, I, I like how he put it. Uh, he said, hope is to expect with confidence, or a better way to word it is to look forward to with confidence. To look forward to. Hope is to look forward to with confidence that everything is going to be all right, but isn't that what we struggle with? We want everything to be all right, but we live in a world that is not all right. We live in a world where things are jacked up and turned sideways, and sometimes we don't know what to do. And we say, what's the point anyway? He says, hope. There's always going to be hope. We want everything to be all right, but we live in a world where things are not all right. Yet this is why Jesus came, to give you and me a hope, or a better word would be confidence. If you look at the word hope, right there in the definition, confidence. He comes to give us a confidence, and he says you should all have that within you. It's something he desires for you. I mentioned uh, first service. I said, uh, I remember a conversation a long time ago when I was talking with my wife, and she, she asked me this question. She, it was just kind of a flippant question. I don't even remember what brought it up, but she's like, you know, so what, what attracted you to me? And I, of course, my wife's good looking. I, you know, I was attracted that way. But I said, you really want to know? And she said, yeah. I said, your confidence. And she's like, what? It wasn't my hair, my shiny shoes. It wasn't my hundreds of pillows that I have in my house. No, it wasn't that. It was her confidence. You see, that kind of a confidence that, that the Word of God is talking about is given from God to you and to me in the form called hope. And it gives us a confidence that in a world that's uncertain, we know we can stand strong. Not because of how good we are, but because of how good God is. And when, you receive, when Jesus relates to you, whether it's first-time salvation or you're walking 20 years with Jesus and all of a sudden you, you, know, uh, you didn't get the job or, or somebody lets you down or you just feel like there's something broken in your life, there is always hope, a confidence that he wants to give to us in this world that, that feels like it's losing all hope. And so what we are to do is to recalibrate our hearts and find our confidence in him. That's the key right there. You don't find your confidence in the store. You don't find your confidence in the bank. You don't find your confidence in your spouse. They, you can find some confidence, but you don't find your hope in anybody but Jesus. That's where you receive that from. So as we prepare to celebrate Christmas this year, there's a couple things that we got to keep in mind. In your first bullet in your outline, write this down. Remember this, Christmas isn't just a day. It's to be a season of life. Or at least that's God's desire for us. 
Uh, Christmas isn't just about even a season on the calendar year as much as it's supposed to be a season of life, or here's a better word, a rhythm. When you listen to music, you can tap your feet, shake your hips, snap your fingers, because you got, I got the rhythm going on, right? That's the kind of life he wants you to have, one that's in sync with him and his Holy Spirit, so that when things change, you can navigate and move quickly because of the leading of the Holy Spirit. But you see, Christmas is a season of life. It's a rhythm of life. It's not about a day. Now, we celebrate Christmas on December 25th. Every year. Everybody argues about what day Jesus was actually born. In my opinion, I don't really care which day it was. I'm just glad he was, right? Because without that, it, we have nothing. And we're going to experience, is, is, is Christmas wrong then? Shouldn't we be having presents and all that stuff? No, 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 no. We, we, we do all that. But all I'm saying is, is that Christmas isn't about just one day. There, Christmas is over. I did my one and done. I don't have to, you know. It's about letting it become a rhythm of your life. Um, the, world, the world understands this word hope. They, they know how to market it, right? Chances are, well, I, I can ask you, but have you walked down a store in the last three to four weeks and you see things in the store that have the word hope all over it? Maybe it's, maybe it's on a pillow, right? Maybe it's on a, a candle or an ornament, on a kitchen towel. Maybe it's even on a sign in your home. And if you have that, right now you're probably going, well, is that wrong to have? No, there's nothing wrong with that. But just realize your salvation's not in your picture that has the word hope in it. Your salvation and your hope is found in Jesus Christ. It's in relationship with Him. The world knows how to market it so that it can get what it wants out of it, but that's not, that's not the kind of hope that Jesus Christ has given us. That's not why we celebrate uh, communion. That's not why we celebrate Christmas. That's not why we have a church, is so we can market it and figure out how to make a buck. It's so that we can celebrate the fact that Jesus came, he was born as a baby, he died, and he rose again. Because of that, we have an eternal hope. See, the world's understanding of hope is limited <clears throat> to just what they can see or how they can use it. But Jesus Christ came to give us a hope that is limitless. It's full of confidence. So that when we place our faith in Him, we will never be disappointed because you and I as Christians are to be a, a people of perpetual hope. That, that's His desire. He wants us to live in that place of hope. How many of you have ever seen the movie Home Alone? I know, that's like asking, did anybody breathe today? You know, everybody's seen this movie. Now, I am not, just hear me on this, I am not trying to, to uh, make any kind of similarities, similarities between Jesus Christ and Kevin McAllister, okay? But I'm just inviting you into the brain of Jim Machen, okay? And it can get kind of crazy at times, but I was sitting here and I was doing this message and I thought, we're to, we're to be in this place of, of hope. And I got thinking about the movie because there was a line in the movie that I remembered. And I thought, you know, it's kind of ironic, the comparisons. You know, you got Jesus and you got Kevin. Again, two different people. I'm, it's crazy. My, my brain, you, you get in there sometimes, you just don't get out, okay? Uh, but I thought, here, Jesus was left alone at a temple. Kevin was left alone at home. Jesus was, um, his parents eventually came looking for him. Kevin McAllister, his parents eventually came looking for him. Jesus was, had an attack from the enemy, the temptations. Remember that when that went on? And I thought, well, good grief, Kevin had an attack. He had the burglars that came in and tried to rip him off. And Jesus overcame the attackers. And I thought, so did Kevin, right? You remember that scene with the ornaments and all the nails and, and he overcame. Now, again, I'm not comparing Kevin McAllister to, to Jesus Christ. My point in the movie is Kevin's mom, and when she's coming back, remember she's trying to get a ticket at an airline. It's, it's when John Candy enters the movie. I know right now you're like, we came to church and somehow we started talking about John Candy and Kevin McAllister, but it, it's right at that point where she's at the ticket counter and she's frustrated because he says, ma'am, I'm sorry, we don't have a ticket. In, in sheer anger, frustration, irritation, she bangs on the counter and says, no, 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 this is Christmas. It's to be a season of perpetual hope. And I thought, okay, she said it through gritted teeth. She said it through irritation. But my point that I'm trying to make today is that the world offers a misguided hope as opposed to eternal hope that we find in relationship with Jesus Christ. 
It, it's there where you find it. She, holidays, holidays can be one of the hardest times. And I get that. I get, I get it. Holidays can be very difficult sometimes because we're reminded of family members that are no longer with us, you know, and, and, and we feel that. Uh, maybe sometimes we struggle with holidays because we don't see it for what it really is, and all it is is a trigger that, that reminds us of some things that we don't want to remember. And so we just look at Christmas and say, bah humbug. But it's not, you know, I, I want you to understand that that, that, that's not what it's about. We, we as Christians, what we have to remember is your second bullet, write this down, that our hope is found in God, not in Walmart or any other store you want to fill in the blank. It's not found in a cup of cocoa with a peppermint stick sitting out of it. Hey, it's not found in any of that. Is there anything wrong with those things? No. Drink cocoa till you vomit. I don't care. All right? But your hope is found in Jesus Christ alone. And we have to remind ourselves of that. Because I don't know about you, sometimes, sometimes, I feel hopeless. I feel like, uh, you know, I'm never going to make it or I'm never going to mount to anything. You might say, how can you feel that? Because I'm human, just like you. And we all feel that. And it's in those moments that we've got to stop and say, no, 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 no. My hope is found in God. And many times I have to say it out loud so I can hear myself say it. But there's three things I want to give you today that can absolutely, you can have confidence in. You can absolutely have confidence in these three things because of the hope of Jesus Christ and what he brings to us. Here's number one. You can be confident, another way to say hope, you can be confident that you are loved. You and I can be confident that we are loved. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he, he gave his only begotten son, right? That whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. This is, in my opinion, this is one of the most powerful verses in the Bible. And the reason I say that is because without a love from God that gives, then all our hope is lost. If God did not love us so much to send his son to die on a cross, then you and I would have no hope. And I know maybe you're sitting here today saying, Jesus did all that and I still feel hopeless. We'll get to that in a moment. Because my question will be, where are you placing that? Is it misguided in looking at the world? Or is it looking to the one who gives us that hope? Our hope is found in God, and you can be confident that you are loved because of the enormous price tag that you and I could never pay. You know, even in the midst of our messes, God loves us. <clears throat> even in the midst of our mindsets. Now, I'm not asking you to nod, raise your hand, or, yeah, that's me. But sometimes our thought processes, we can think on things, dwell on things, and try to escape reality, and we wish we had this, and we wish we had that. You know, even in those moments, God says, I love you. I love you so much. It, even in the midst of our mindsets and our messes, when we don't prioritize them as number one, he says, I'm still willing to give you hope. Every time. You know, if you read on past John 3, 16, there's a few verses after that. And what you find out is that, is that you and I are the objects of God's great love and we discover how valuable we are to him. Um, regardless of how you feel, Christ says you're valuable. He says you are valuable. Maybe you're not feeling much into the Christmas spirit this year. You might say, I'm just not feeling it. You're still valuable. Maybe you're, you're not feeling the, the hype. I, I just have a hard time getting into it. You know, you're still valuable to God. It doesn't matter how much you like or dislike Christmas. We all have different levels and very, I, I, I mentioned it first service, but I went ahead and printed this out because I was like just sitting at home. And I think my family, I think my wife and my daughter absolutely love Christmas. I think Seth and I, now hear, hear my heart. I'm not saying I don't love Christmas. I'm saying I love Christmas, but I don't feel like I have to decorate the whole house to, you know, that's just me. I love how she does it. It looks beautiful, as long as I don't have to do it all, right? Because if it were me, Charlie Brown tree, Merry Christmas. And that's all I'd need. But I was sitting one day watching her decorate the tree. Now, I'm not that mean. I would help her. I'd hand her a ball to do something, but I didn't do a whole lot. Let's just, full disclosure, she did all that. 
Well, I pulled out my phone and I took a quiz on how much of the Christmas spirit do you have? And I thought, oh, okay. So I went through and I had a number of questions. And as the quiz progressed on, I started to get concerned for my very soul here. Um, because it comes and it tells you who you are. You want to know who I am? You might not know this name, but if you're into movies, if you're a Bruce Willis fan, and if you've seen the movie Die Hard, I came out to be Hans Gruber. Okay? And here's what it means. It says, you are Hans Gruber. The holidays are the perfect time of the year to get things done that you've been neglecting to do for quite some time. Effort and thought do not enter your mind when you go Christmas shopping. Gift cards and money are the extent of your imagination. Receiving and giving gifts is the same for you as long as there's time for you to be alone. And I thought, that is me. <laughs> I love it. You know, does that mean I don't love Christmas? No, I love Christmas. Does that mean I don't love Jesus because I'm not all in the spirit? No, I love Jesus. It's not about how we feel. That's, that's, not, where, that's not where we decide. Maybe, so maybe this year, maybe you're dealing with brokenness. And you're just going through a season where things just aren't right or they don't feel right. You know, I have a friend of mine who told me, he says, sometimes, sometimes I, I feel like people feel like they're, they belong in the land of the misfit toys. You know, I just feel like I don't belong. I, you know, I'm here, I'm, a, I'm, I'm breathing, but I'm not really living. I'm, I'm present, but I'm, I'm not really, I feel like I'm contributing and and maybe, maybe you feel that way. You know what? When you feel that way, your lowest point, God says, I have a hope that I give to you. Maybe you'd say it's hard to hope and love this holiday season. You see, when you and I find ourselves in those scenarios, the Word of God urges us to look back at the cross. When you're feeling unloved or like you can't make it, look at the cross because there's always going to be one greater than you that loves you. So you have to make sure you've got this settled in your heart. Number one, you can be confident that you are loved. Number two, you can be confident that you can have peace. When you place your hope in Jesus Christ, you can be confident that you can have peace. You and I, we can find that peace in the middle of a crazy world. Um, and craziness comes in many different forms and fashions. You know, people can say, man, you know, the, the traffic's crazy. Some of you might say, my children are crazy. Some of you might say, my parents are crazy. Some of you might say, work is chaotic, home is chaotic. You know, I remember complaining about how, how uh, I, I grew up in Clinton all my life, okay? Uh, from, from the moment I was born till 20-something when we moved. And uh, I remember in Clinton thinking, you know, it's a decent-sized town, but you always think that when you grow up in the town that you're in. And then when I would go to the Quad Cities, I'd be like, man, the Quad Cities, the traffic is horrible. They don't know how to drive around here. Yeah, yeah, you know. Then we moved to Dallas, Texas. You want to talk about crazy? I, it, was, it was a complete culture shock in so many ways. I, I, thought, I thought this was crazy, but then all of a sudden here I am in, in Dallas, Texas, home of God's favorite football team, by the way. <laughs> I had to throw that in there. In the traffic, I remember when we first pulled in, pulling a U-Haul behind us, and I'm driving down the road, and people are flying all around like, we're going to die. You know, that's just how I felt. But you give me two months, and before you know it, whew, whew, I'm dry, I, and I got into a rhythm. And, what do you mean? You're crazy yourself? No, I figured out the rhythm. Maybe a little crazy, but you get my point. I figured out that rhythm. Maybe you're going through a season in life where change is happening. And it feels chaotic, but he says, when you feel the most chaotic, that's when my hope can become the greatest. You see, we don't like change when it happens in life, but the one thing that never changes is God's love for us and the peace that he makes available to you and to me. But here's the question. I want to ask you this question. Where do you place your hope? Where do you place your hope? Now, I, I, if you're... Uh, this is what I would do if somebody asked me, Pastor Jim, where do you place your hope? I place it in Jesus. Because that's the answer that we're supposed to give, you know what I mean, as Christians. But I've had times, this is just, just sharing with you what happened with me once, uh, where the Holy Spirit asked me, he said, Jim, where are you placing your hope in this? And I'm like, I place it in you, Jesus. And he's like, do you really? Well, yeah, of course I do, God. Really? Yes. Well, then why... And then he would speak to me, 
about whatever the situation was. And what he did was he started to show me, why am I trusting in others more than I'm trusting in him? Well, how do you know I'm, I'm doing that, God? Because you're always talking to them. I haven't heard from you lately. Ooh. You know, I'm not placing my hope in him. Now, he didn't say that in a, condemn, a, 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 a condemning way. He just brought a gentle conviction to my heart that said, Jim, my hope is so great and I love you so much. Do you know that God loves you so much and has a great hope for you in all that you are doing? But what he wants us to understand is that when life changes, his love never does. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. It's one of the promises that he gives us in the Bible. But the question is, where do you place your hope? You can't get God's blessings without doing it God's way. Here's what it says in Luke chapter 2 to kind of further just shine a light on the, on the Christmas story. It says, In the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the, of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you was born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord, and this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God, saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth, and here's the key word, peace. And on the earth, he said, peace among, peace among those with whom he is pleased. He says, I, I, I give you my, my peace. When you place your hope, you and I, when we place our hope in Christ, his peace comes with all of that because only the peace of God will bring the sense of value that we long for in our lives. Um, when you place your hope in God, peace arrives on the scene. There was a, a long time ago, <clears throat> a man sought a perfect, priceless picture of what peace is. And not finding one he, that satisfied him, he announced the contest to produce the masterpiece. And that challenge stirred the imagination of artists everywhere. And so, as paintings arrived one by one from far and wide, they got to, together for the day of revelation. They were going to unveil these pictures. And the judges uncovered one peaceful scene after another. And the viewers that were watching, they would clap, you know, oh, that's a good one too. And they really liked it. But the tension grew as they got towards the end, and there was only two left. A judge pulled the cover from one, and a hush fell over the crowd. It was a mere smooth lake reflecting lacy green birch under the soft blush of the evening sky. It was so beautiful. Along the grassy shore, a flock of sheep grazed undisturbed. Surely this was the winner. This had to be, right? But there was one picture left. And the gentleman <clears throat> pulled the tarp off of that. And when he did, the crowd gasped in surprise. And they stood back. And they were, they were shocked at what they saw. They said, could this, be, could this be peace? And a tumultuous, on this picture, there was a tumultuous waterfall that cascaded down a, a rocky precipice. And the crowd could almost feel the coldness. They could almost feel like the spray from the water was penetrating them. There was a stormy gray cloud that threatened to explode with lightning. There was wind, there was rain, but in the midst of this thundering, uh, noises and bitter chill that the picture was emanating. There was this spindly tree that just clung to the rocks on the edge of the falls. One of its branches, branches reached out in front of the torrential waters as if foolishly seeking to experience the full power of the waterfall. And on that branch, a little bird had built a nest in the elbow of the branch. Content, and undisturbed in her stormy surroundings, she rested on top of her eggs. And with her eyes closed and her wings ready to cover her little ones, she manifested peace that transcends all earthly turmoil. See, that's a real picture of what peace looks like because you and I, we don't live in a perfect world. We live in a world that's full of trials, tribulations. There's a lot of problems that are out there. You never know what's coming around the corner. But true peace is this. It's when you and I come to a place that we place our hope in Christ, then we have a confidence not only that we're loved, but we have a confidence that we can have a peace that surpasses all of this that we're going through. 
Have you ever gone through life and just wondered, how, how am I going to make it? How am I ever going to get through all of this? Sometimes <clears throat> peace or hope doesn't always look the way that we think it should. Could it be that when we have Jesus at the center of our lives, that it doesn't necessarily change all of our circumstances around us, but it might just change us in the midst of all of our circumstances? So maybe you ask the question that I asked myself, how can I have that kind of a hope? How, how, do, I, how do I get that? Well, the answer is found in Hebrews 11.6, and it says this, and without faith, it is impossible to please him. Say that with me. Ready, go. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. Impossible. It takes faith. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he, and, uh, that he rewards those who seek him. The answer to the question, how can I have that kind of faith, is uh, have that kind of hope, is where do you place your faith? It's about faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. But the key is found in drawing near to God because that's when he draws near to us. And as he does, that's where our hope is found. You don't have to be a superhero, by the way, to have this kind of a hope. Uh, it's when you choose to place Christ at the center of your life and all that you do. Then you discover that hope is already there. And it's that kind of a faith that we need to have when we face difficult seasons in life. There's been many times in my life I know that I've felt or thought or even said things like, um, I feel as if I've lost hope. You know, I just feel like I'm at that place. Uh, I feel like I'm beyond lovable by God, and by others. I feel like I'm not good enough. I feel like I'm not smart enough. I feel like you can fill in the blank with whatever you want. But that's why our hope must be found in faith, not feelings. Because feelings change, but God never does. His love never does for us. It's never been about how good we are or how bad we are, as much as it's been about placing our faith in Jesus Christ and experiencing his peace and his hope. See, again, it's not about how good you are, but about how good God is. And then number three, the thing that we can take to the bank is you can be confident that you and I, we belong to God. You can be confident that we belong to God. Now, when the enemy of our soul, what he wants to do is he wants to remind you and me of our past mistakes and our indiscretions. What the enemy wants to do is remind you of your present troubles and that you're not good enough. In other words, all hope is lost. The enemy wants to taunt you and me <clears throat> about our futures and that it will never amount to anything. And that's when we must tell ourselves we have to do this. That's when we tell ourselves that we belong to God. Say it with me. We belong to God. One more time and mean it. We belong to God. Sometimes you just got to hear yourself say it because if you wait till you feel it, I belong to God. All my hope is in Jesus Christ. If you wait to feel that way, it's never going to come. Or if it does, it's going to be very rare. You see, hope is a choice. You must choose. It's a gift that God gives, but engaging with that is a choice. Back in the day when King Herod uh, you know, the Gospels, King Herod, <coughs> excuse me, um, had his temple there. There were different courts around, around the area. And if you weren't worthy enough, you know, worthy, uh, you dare not pass those gates and go into those courts or you would lose your life. They would kill you. In other words, there was a culture that communicated, if you're not good enough, then don't even bother. It was a culture that communicated this feeling that some people were good enough to enter the king's presence, while others were just leftovers who shouldn't even try to come into the king's presence. I want you to know today that the hope that Jesus Christ gives us tells us this, we are not leftovers. We are not leftovers, yet that's exactly what the lie the enemy wants to sell us. We have hope. We are not hopeless. We are worthy, not because of what we've done, but because of Jesus Christ. Now, here's why I read the genealogy earlier. Uh, remember I read that? And it was like, yeah, yeah, he begat them and that. Here, take a look at this. At the beginning of the message, I, I shared this. It's interesting to me to see the lineage of Jesus Christ and who makes up that lineage, the family tree. 
Um, what I noticed is that even in Jesus Christ's family, every, per- every person there had a purpose. Every person in the lineage of Jesus was there for that season and time. You know, at that moment, they probably didn't know what was so valuable about them. They probably didn't know what, what to do next. You know, what's my direction in life? But as they continue to remain faithful, everything lined up until we saw the birth of Jesus. You and I can have a confidence today that Jesus Christ has chosen us. Uh, th- I want you to just think of this. In the lineage or the genealogy, you see that Ruth was in there. Ruth was a Moabite. Now, technically, without getting too deep, a Moabite would not be in the lineage of Jesus Christ, Christ but Ruth was because of the choice she made to remain faithful to God. Rahab was in the lineage of Jesus Christ. Guess what, folks? You know what Rahab was? She was a prostitute. A, Rahab was a prostitute who, who not only uh, lived that lifestyle, but she helped the spies escape, if we were to go back and look at that story. My point is simply this. The line of Jesus Christ comes through broken people. So if you're here today and you feel like you're broken, there's hope. There's always hope. There's always going to be hope. Maybe you're listening to what's being said today and, and you feel broken or you feel like you or one of those misfit toys. Well, we can have a confidence today that Jesus Christ has chosen us. Nothing can separate us from the love of God except our own will. Except our own will. I want to read to you a closing verse, and then I'm going to give you a closing question to think on. Here it is. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16 says, Let us then with confidence, okay, Let us with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. Here's my closing question. Do you have this kind of hope? Do you have it? You can. It's free of charge. It's there. Well, Pastor, I thought you just told me that the hope was already there. It is, but you've got to engage with that. My prayer for you is simply this. If you don't have that kind of a hope, you can choose it today. You could see that, you know, uh, whether it be salvation, whether it be you're going through a difficult time of brokenness, God comes and wants to heal. But my question again is, do you have that kind of a hope? Will you pray with me as I just simply ask, Father, for those of us that are here and we're walking through the season where maybe we do feel broken, Jesus, I pray that you would give us a passion to respond to you and walk out that relationship with you. I want to I want to just simply ask, well, we all have our heads bowed and eyes closed. Are you here today? And you're saying, Pastor, that hit me in the nose. Or maybe, a, uh, maybe it's a, it just that really stirred my heart. Maybe you're here today and, and you need hope, that kind of a hope, a relationship with Jesus. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to call you out, but I'm going to give you an opportunity to receive that kind of hope. If you're here today and you need to ask the Lord into your heart, just simply raise your hand. And I want to agree with you in prayer. I'm not going to call you out. I'm not going to embarrass you. Jesus, you see my brother's hand. You see his heart. I pray today that you'd come and you'd fill him with your spirit and that you'd fill him with your hope and that all things would become new in Jesus' name. Any others here today? You say, that's me. I'll wait for just a moment. Okay. Uh, Go ahead and put your hands down. I'm going to pray this over all of us. I don't want to just ask, are you here and you need hope? I'm going to just assume every one of us do. Father, I pray today that as we prepare to leave this place, for those here that are present, for those that are watching online, and we're in a place where we feel hopeless, Jesus, we're asking that you would give us a grace and a mercy that goes beyond our experiences of life. Lord, I pray today that as we choose to place our hope in you, that we will experience an overwhelming understanding of how much you love us. Lord, for the many times we've screwed things up or we did it the wrong way, Lord, that you would come by your Holy Spirit and give us a peace that goes beyond all understanding so that we can understand exactly who we belong to. We belong to you. So we ask for this. We receive it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, as Pastor was praying that over us, I uh, was reminded there's a scripture that says, hope deferred makes the heart sick. And I think maybe for some of us, 
there's been some hope deferred. Can you allow Jesus to redeem that hope for you in this season and to redeem that, that dream that we allowed to die because our, hope, our hearts got sick in the midst of it? So if that, I don't know if that's for anybody, if that's just for me or if that's for 12 of you out there. Just, um, I just encourage you, take that and don't allow um, hope to make, hope deferred to make your heart sick because Jesus came. He's the hope and the light of the world and he came to redeem our hope in him. So I'm going to ask if you'll stand this morning. Before we do our closing prayer, just one adjustment to the announcements. Ladies, we're meeting Tuesday night at 6.30, not Wednesday. If you have daughters and you want to bring them with, the crafts are definitely something they can do. So I'll see you over in the other building Tuesday at 6.30. Let's do our closing prayer together. Father, help me to live this day to the full, being true to you in every way. Jesus, help me to give myself away to others, being kind to everyone I meet. And Spirit, help me to love the lost, proclaiming Christ in all I do and say. Amen. Have a great week.